Hey everyone, Eric here. A lot more people in Washington and other capitals are focusing more attention on what the Chinese are doing in places like Africa, the Middle East, the Americas. But this isn't an issue that you can simply jump into and expect to understand what's going on. Things are moving just way too fast. And this is a story that really doesn't fit neatly with a lot of the prevailing narratives. And that's why the newsletter that we produce is so important. It's the day-to-day -day tracking of the story that will help you get up to speed. We meticulously go through hundreds of sources every day to bring you a concise digest of the day's top China news from Africa and throughout the global south. And then we deliver it straight to your inbox Monday to Friday at 6 a.m. Washington time. Try it free for 30 days. See if you like it. Subscriptions start at just $7 a month for students and teachers and $15 a month for everybody else. Sign up today at ChinaAfricaProject.com slash subscribe. Once again, that's ChinaAfricaProject.com slash subscribe. The China in Africa podcast is brought to you in partnership with the Africa China Reporting Project at Wits University in Johannesburg. The ACRP aims to improve the quality of reporting on Africa China relations through reporting grants, workshops, and other opportunities for journalists. More information at africachinareporting.co.za and our dedicated training website at africachinatraining.com. Hello and welcome to another edition of the China in Africa podcast, a proud member of the Seneca Network from SubChina. I'm Eric Olander, and as always, I'm joined by Kobus van Staden, the senior China-Africa researcher at the South African Institute of International Affairs in Johannesburg, South Africa. A very good morning to you, Kobus. Good morning. Kobus, over the past week, there's been a fascinating series of events that have been unfolding in Sierra Leone. So last week we got word that China and Sierra Leone had agreed to a $55 million deal to create a fishing harbor, a port, a fish meal processing plant. And, and that's been a subject of actual contention and dispute as to what they're doing. This then sparked a big uproar in the international media, but also in Sierra Leone about the environmental consequences of that. Since then, we have seen that the Chinese embassy in Freetown has come back out and has said, well, once again, this is the Western media slandering China-Africa relations. This is also social media reports that are fake. This is not accurate news. And what it highlights in many respects is the communication divide that exists in China's South-South dialogue. This was a simple deal. This was not a controversial thing. And CNN did a story by Jenny Marsh where she asked the question, why was there any secrecy around this deal? But yet there was. And it brings up the point, Kobus, that you wrote about also for a column in our newsletter about here we are in this real different time in this new era where China is much more active in the developing world. It's a big player in the global development sector, especially now that the British are cutting back their aid by almost a third to places like Africa. China just announced a new $3 billion financial aid package that's going to be committed to COVID-19 relief that President Xi Jinping made at the G20 Global Health Summit in Rome. And so here we are in this real contentious moment right now where we're speaking the same words and we understand what people are saying, but the meanings are getting lost. Kobus, Share a little bit of your insights on what this Sierra Leone incident really says about the broader China Global South South relationship. You know, for, for me, there's, there's a few a few issues. One is, as as you highlighted, how these these deals are communicated. Um, you know, the the, the tendency um, to want everything to be secret, um, or to have, have very high levels of secrecy, both on the Chinese and recipient country side, tend to then like fuel assumptions that there's something shady going on, even when there isn't. In the I, I have to say I don't know enough about this particular project to know how shady it is. Um, it doesn't sound environmentally sustainable, or you know, environmentally as as sustainable and as as kind of you know forward thinking as it could be. Um, but that said, the other issue that that it really raises raises for me is is decision making on the recipient country side. Um, you know, in in a situation where Chinese companies are, are willing to sell whatever one wants to buy, including you know, kind of including solutions like, for example, coal 
coal-powered electricity um, that is actually would, would would be I think would be clear to say are terrible solutions, um, you know, and and really good solutions. Um, you know, China being a, a kind of a major provider of something like solar energy as well. So then the decision making of of the res, of the, the recipient government really comes into focus, and with it then the the kind of assumption from you know from the Chinese side that that to to kind of to push that kind of decision making in any kind of direction is an I intervention in in local government sovereignty. You know that the whole sovereignty local government agency decision making issue becomes really really fraught when the the government in in question makes terrible decisions. So the Chinese economic and commercial counselor at the embassy Du Zujun. He said, to your point, Kobus, that this is not a Chinese government project. This is an assistance project that is for the government of Sierra Leone has requested to help construct for the purpose of promoting the development of Sierra Leone's own fishery sector. Those are Du's word. And the point here is, as you pointed out, this is actually a request from the Sierra Leone government. What it also reveals is, again, this big gaps in the communication, in the understanding, in how development is articulated and communicated by the Chinese, by the host government, and then interpreted by the outside world. And that brings us again, Kobus, to a subject you and I have had a lot of conversations on recently, is about the knowledge deficits that exist about the Chinese. That is, people in places like the Caribbean, in Africa, the Middle East, who are engaging the Chinese still lack a lot of understanding on who they are, where they're coming from, the historical context. Lots of different reasons for that. By the way, that's not uniquely a Global South phenomenon. This is something we've been pointing out about the State Department in the United States. So we thought today it would be very interesting to try and address these issues from the point of view of trying to narrow some of these knowledge deficits and really articulate what a Chinese worldview on global development is. And for that, we are thrilled to have on the show for the first time Professor Yao Yang, who is the Dean of the National School of Development at Peking University. He's also the Executive Dean at the Institute of South-South Cooperation and Development and Director at the China Center for Economic Research. He joins us on the line for the first time from Beijing. Professor Yao, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show. We really appreciate it. Thank you for inviting me, Mr. Orlando. Uh, this is a great opportunity for me. It's really an honor for us to have you on the program because we don't get as many opportunities as we would like to hear from Chinese voices such as yourself who have had the opportunity to engage in these discussions on global South-South development and South-South cooperation. We have the situation in Sierra Leone, which is in many ways typical of some of the disagreements that China's had, not only with various stakeholders in the global South, but also in terms of the relationship that it has with the international media and outside observers. Can you talk to us a little bit about where you think we are right now in this moment in terms of China's relationship in the global South and how it's resolving these types of disputes with its development partners? Well, as I listened to the story uh, you two were talking about, uh, uh, I was also wondering why you know this uh, was a request uh, by the recipient country, uh, but why it ended up with uh, a question uh, on the China side. I think uh, uh, this is quite related uh, to people's unawareness uh, about uh, the decision-making process in China or uh, more deeply, uh, kind of a misunderstanding about uh, the Chinese political system. Uh, to me, to understand uh, China's political system, the starting point is always to understand the Communist Party. The Communist Party is no longer a Western-style political party. I mean, in a, when I say Western-style political parties, I mean parties that represent uh, just a section of the population. But the Communist Party is not such a party. It's an all-people's party, right? It's actually a building uh, block of the Chinese constitution, right? <clears throat> Pretty much follows uh, our Confucian teaching, or, or what I call the Confucian state, right? We need uh, such a centralized decision maker to make a policy and the recommendation of laws to the People's Congress, and then the People's Congress approve those laws. Uh, so that's uh, quite different from other countries, right? So in other countries, you hear and see debates in the parliament, 
Uh, but usually that doesn't happen in China because most of the decisions are made by the Communist Party. Uh, so uh, the National People's Congress uh, plays a role uh, only when uh, laws need to be passed. Uh, and also China has this tradition to have a strong administration. And the party and the executive branch of the government which we call the state council, is mingled together. Okay? So uh, that's also quite different from uh, uh, other countries, right? Uh, so in many cases, uh, it sounds like there is not enough uh, debates, not enough information, disclosure, and then outsiders uh, may just wonder what's going on in China. But that's the way how the Chinese government uh, is working. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about uh, about about the, the kind of role or the, the interaction between centralization, uh, you know, like centralized decision making, as 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 you've um, outlined it now at home, compared to China's activities in the world. Um, you know, so so it, it would seem to I think to to outside viewers that that because you know because the structure is set up with with such a kind of a strong central authority that decisions about for example standard setting internationally or for example about about what kinds of electricity that's just what i happen to be focusing on at the moment so this is where my my examples are coming from but um you know so I, i've been looking over the last while at at decisions by chinese companies in terms of of what kinds of electricity they're funding in the rest of the world uh, coal powered versus other um and it's it's very interesting that as as you point out that there is this kind of centralized system but at the same time the decisions made by chinese companies about what kinds of electricity they're funding internationally or that they that they that they're implementing internationally is all across the spectrum you know kind of like from 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 solar right to to coal powered so you know so so how how do how do those two come together the wide range of decision making in the rest of the world with the the relative centralization of decision making within China? Uh, well, I, I think there is a, also another misunderstanding about uh, China's decision-making process. What I was talking about was just about the decisions made by the government. But you have to separate the government from the economy. You know, in China, private economy uh, dominates. It contributes to uh, 70% of China's GDP and also 19% of employment, right? So China has a mixed economic system. I don't think uh, the government can decide uh, uh, what uh, a private company invests outside China, uh, right? So I, I'm not familiar with the things uh, happening in Africa, but I do have an example. Uh, this is a, a MBA graduated from our school. And he he was doing uh, power plant in China, but he also set up uh, power plants in Africa. But that was uh, his uh, own decision making. I asked him why he set up a fire power station uh, in Africa. He said, I make money. I make more money in Africa than in China because uh, electricity is so scarce in Africa and they need a fire uh, power station, right? Uh, so I guess most of those uh, decisions actually are being made by private companies. Uh, even uh, for many state-owned enterprises, they actually make uh, their investment decisions uh, mostly by themselves. Uh, and this, in some special cases, uh, when there is a government-to-government agreement. Otherwise, most of those decisions are made by individual companies. Just following up on that, the you know kind of I, I agree with you that that they are made by private companies, but a lot of these projects are funded by state institutions like the China Exim Bank, and underwritten by by other state related institutions like like Sinosure. So you know, so so there is a connection with the central government there. Uh, not not really, you know. Even those like uh, Exim Bank, Exim Bank uh, operates uh, separately. Right? They 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 have to take care of commercial goals. I, 
you know, this is a big misunderstanding about China, which means, oh, this is a government-owned company, so every action of this company is an order from above. No, they make their own decisions, right? They are going to evaluate the project, whether this project is going to make money or not. As I said, and this, uh, in the case of government-to-government uh, agreement, Otherwise, you know, those, most of those decisions are being made by individual companies, including Exim Bank. I guess I'm very confused here. And I think, Kobus, you might be as well, because what we follow are the, the Belt and Road and the, the state-owned enterprises like China Road and Bridge Corporation, China Communications Construction Corporation. You name these massive oil companies, construction firms, so many of, of the different firms that are out there that are... Again, they get preferential tax treatment. They may not get a direction from Beijing as to what to do, but there's a very close relationship between the political structure, the economic structure, and the corporate governance. It's not like, say, IBM in the West, which or in the United States, which has no relationship to the government whatsoever. So again, I, I fully see where you're coming from, where they're not taking a necessarily a political direction from Beijing to do something, but they have access to all of these public policy and public financing tools that incentivize them to make investments in places like Angola and Venezuela, for example, where there may not be a return on the investment, but it fits a broader objective of China. Am I completely misunderstanding that, or am I misunderstanding what you're saying? Uh, definitely. Many of those companies just follow uh, government's course right, to invest outside China. Uh, but uh, we, we, we cannot put uh, them in just a one basket, right? Uh, and also many uh, of those projects and the order of the government have lost money, uh, just like you said, right? Uh, but that happened mostly uh, 10 years ago, just after the financial crisis, uh, when the Chinese government said, uh, particularly to those uh, resource companies, uh, go abroad to buy uh, those resource mines, uh, oil fields, right? But after that round, uh, many of those SOEs uh, have learned a lesson, right? Uh, they have to be careful. They have to do their due diligence. We're very much like uh, a commercial entity, okay? Uh, I, I, I don't think nowadays... Uh, they still invest outside China uh, just to fulfill the government's uh, direction uh, without considering financial terms, right? Uh, but within China, those companies uh, do get the preferential treatments, uh, mostly because they are so big and they're not going to fail, right? Um, I, I don't think uh, it's uh, that much related to ownership. It's just a uh, about their size. If you look at those big private companies, uh, they also get uh, good access to finance in China. Right? It, it's actually divided by size, not so much by ownership. Uh, if you look at a small SOE, it's very difficult for that small guy to get finance either. We've seen over the last while, the last few years, is this this moves from China to 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 step into a, a, a more of a of a norm making position in the world. You know, kind of as calls by by uh, by the government, for example, for for global reforms in institutions like the UN, for example. You know, kind of a, just just trying to to kind of to get global standard setting to 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 acknowledge the the global south. Um, c- could you talk a little bit about about this kind of role, this emerging role of China as a global standard setter like how you know how, how does the government see it and and you know kind of uh, and, and and what kind of what kind of role does that play in in China's international presence well I think uh, for the whole world uh, that uh, should be a welcoming uh, step uh, in the past uh, China just to follow the rules uh, because of that the China did not see itself as a big stakeholder in the world system, right? So if you're a small guy, you just uh, use the existing international system, okay? Uh, So that gives uh, China a lot of uh, room uh, to go around, right? Uh, 
Uh, but today, uh, China um, believes it's strong enough uh, to participate in decision making and rule making uh, in world uh, international organizations. Um, <coughs> so, uh, by engaging China in the decision making process, I think the international community can make China to become a more responsible uh, stakeholder. Okay. Uh, and, uh, you know, China is still a newcomer uh, in this stage, right? So, uh, you know, as a newcomer, it stumbled many, many times, right? Uh, so it still needs time uh, for China to become more sophisticated uh, in the participation of rulemaking. Well, making China a more responsible stakeholder has been something that we've been hearing about for 20 or 30 years. In fact, that was one of the motivations to bring China into the World Trade Organization uh, that the United States sponsored 20, 25 years ago. The United States has been disappointed with the results of that Europe as well. And so it does create this moment of tension that we're in right now in terms of the international order and China's desire to assert itself and representative of its power in the global system. So when we talk about what Cobus brought up, this idea of rules making, how far does China go where it pushes itself in such a way that really is forcing a reaction from the incumbent powers like the United States and Europe and others to the point where it feels like it has to assert itself because it has interests that, again, as the world's second largest economy, it, you know, does have some legitimacy in pushing itself, but at the same time, we're in this this moment of of tension right now in terms of how we structure the international order. How do you think and how do you describe the moment that we're in right now? I believe that we are entering a new stage. You know, the uh, current world trade uh, system was created and supported by the United States, but now the United States is uh, not satisfied by the current system, uh, mostly because of China, right? They, you know, 20 years ago, China was a small guy. And the United States brought China into the system and thought, uh, oh, uh, by engaging you into the system, you're going to behave like us, okay? Uh, but China, as I said, was a newcomer. Uh, China's task in the past was just to, to use uh, the existing uh, world system, right? I, I don't agree that China uh, breached uh, the WTO rule or something. I mean, WTO actually issued uh, a, a report uh, 10 years ago that said that China fulfilled you know, 90% of its uh, promise. Of course, someone would say, oh, the rest of 10% was the most important. But we can debate on that. All right? But the, my point is that uh, now... United States and some other European countries are not satisfied with the current system. So the current system needs to be reformed. Then uh, it comes to how to reform the system. And my advice is always United States and China should sit down and talk because it's mostly about those two countries, right? If those two countries can come up uh, with uh, a new set of rules, uh, then... Uh, they too uh, bring those rules to WTO negotiation table. I think that will make uh, the reform of WTO much more easier. But the problem is we can't talk right now. And this is very concerning that the tone between the two countries, and this is not just in the United States, but also in China, is so toxic and there's so much distrust and I, I think about what it is for developing countries who feel like they are caught in the middle of this dispute between the great powers. Here in Southeast Asia, there's a big concern about having to take a side between China and the U.S. And then also in Africa, there's also a concern. And so what happens if the two countries can't talk to each other? Yeah, that's a, a huge ch challenge. My understanding is that uh, first, the United States is uh, now furious about China, right? Uh, so it, it's, a, it's a still in the stage of anger, right? Uh, China hasn't become more like the United States. So many people in the U.S. Uh, believe that uh, uh, the Americans 
the China policy has failed. Okay, so then they turn to be really angry about China. Uh, but a deeper reason is that uh, China has a different political system uh, than uh, a liberal democracy, right? So if uh, uh, the two countries talk, if uh, the two countries uh, still maintain a good uh, or harmonious uh, economic relations, uh, then United States is going to help China, is going to help uh, this uh, different system. And this different system is going to compete with uh, the American system. So this is not going to work, right? So fundamentally, is it still this uh, fundamental question whether Americans believe that uh, the Chinese system is legitimate, is a viable alternative to liberal democracy? Right? And my suggestion to my American friends is always, uh, look, this is China's own business. This is Chinese people's own business. Right? Give China some time. You look at the democracy, it has a lot of failures. China, of course, has a lot of problems, but why not China uh, to try something new, okay? Uh, perhaps uh, China can succeed or perhaps China will fail, but either way, we can learn something from that, right? It's just like we learned a lot from uh, the failure of uh, Soviet-style socialism. We learned a lot. Okay, uh, so I, I think uh, unless American elites uh, to develop such an understanding, it would be really difficult for the two countries to treat each other as a normal country. But if for the moment um, we, we leave Western pressure just out, out of the conversation for the moment, um, what, what would you say is China's own kind of global vision right now you know kind of with, with within within China if one looks at, at China's kind of planning for itself it's you know there's, there's all of these dazzling plans like massive technological advancement you know um, carbon carbon uh, neutrality by 2030 and you know kind of and, and, and very sharp cuts in, 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 in carbon emissions by 2060 for example so so you know so so there's a very clear kind of vision of, of, of China's future but what is China's vision of the world's future um, you know because because I think from from that from the global south perspective it, it looks that picture looks a lot more confusing you know because uh, because the thing is China is is funding is so happy to fund anything you know not anything I mean but, but I mean you know kind of for example again you know sorry it's my bugbear at the moment but like you know I'm, I'm focusing in, in my own research on on electricity provision and you know China is very active in in funding solar for example but they're also very active in funding coal power so is there a kind of a vision for the world that's running through the way that China that China is, is dealing with the world or is it essentially China's going to be amazing and the rest of the world need to make their own decisions? The current China position is that we are going to respect the decisions of African countries or any other countries, right? So if you need uh, solar power, we are going to provide the solar power. If you need the firepower, we are going to provide the firepower. That's uh, African people's own decision. This is uh, not China's decision. So this is, you can say China does not have a global vision, right? Probably that's true. China does not. China doesn't believe it's time for China to provide a global vision. Right? Um, so if you ask a China's global region, it's just a you know a, a self determination, right? Every country has uh, the right to have its own political system, and that's just uh, coexist. And every country is entitled to make uh, its own decision about its own future, including you know environmental policy. Okay, so I, I think that's China's stand today. But then what is the Belt and Road then? If China doesn't have a global vision, what is the Belt and Road? Well, the Belt and Road is just to help developing countries to catch up uh, with uh, advanced economies, right? But China uh, respects each country's own decision. 
Uh, that doesn't mean China does not do anything, right? Uh, China has done all sorts of N plus one stuff. Okay, uh, just uh, to uh, link China with the uh, rest of the world or, or countries along one belt, one road. Okay, uh, I the, to be honest, I'm not going to say that China does not have any geopolitical purpose. Uh, that's untrue, right? Uh, if I say that, I would be lying. Uh, China does have a geopolitical purpose, but uh, it's different from Western countries. China does not put any conditions on the aid or commercial investment. It's uh, those recipient countries' decision. But if a recipient country decides that it's in its interest and it it's its values to disagree with China on some of its core interests such as the South China Sea, Hong Kong, Xinjiang, Taiwan, Tibet, you name it. Any of the, the what China decides is its core interests. China reacts very, very strongly to that. And I guess what we don't understand very much on the outside world is on the one hand, you'll say we respect the decisions of another country and we won't interfere in the internal affairs of that other country so long as it doesn't cross any of China's so-called red lines. How does that work in terms of balancing the non-interference doctrine with a country then expressing its values that may be in disagreement with China's core interests? Well, that's the same thing, right? Uh, China does not interfere other countries' uh, uh, domestic affairs, uh, but we, 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 we believe that other countries should do the same uh, reciprocally, right? So we believe uh, Hong Kong, Xinjiang, are just China's internal issues. So uh, this should be left to uh, for China to decide. Okay. So, th- so I think that's fair, right? That that's a so-called a reciprocity. Over the last few, like two or three years, we've seen we've seen a reemergence in, in particularly in, in in America of of a kind of a a view of of the the world as a kind of a bipolar view, as, uh, which which has become you know um, known as a kind of a new Cold War view, um, a kind of an us or them you know division, it, and particularly it, it really informs um, American approaches to to Africa, for example this idea of, of you know kind of, of of having to kind of build up influence against Chinese influence um, in, in in parts of the global south um, is that view of the world that kind of idea of a cold war or a kind of a division a line of influence kind of like d- dividing the world between Chinese interests and 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 uh, American interests is that echoed within Beijing do you think I, I think that this comes back uh, to my criticism on uh, United States, uh, that is the United States uh, see China as an ideological rival, right? So the American elites uh, believed if China invested in Africa, then China will influence those countries and those countries are going to follow China's way, not uh, American way, uh, which is uh, liberal democracy, right? Um, I, I don't think uh, that worry is necessary. As I said, China does not want to interfere into the domestic choices uh, right, of those countries. Right? So if uh, they love democracy, they just do it. But if uh, they want to have a different path uh, of political development, uh, China will just follow it. Let's turn the conversation to human rights. It's a topic that used to divide the United States and China, and China in the, in the outside world for quite some time. During the Trump administration, it died down. Human rights now, again, under the Biden administration, is a much more popular topic. In places like Africa and the global south, the Chinese view of human rights finds a much bigger audience than it does in the U.S., in Europe, for example. And we talked about, when you and I were on a panel discussion a couple weeks ago, about the hierarchy of rights that China assigns to human rights. Can you talk to us about how the Chinese worldview on human rights is and that hierarchy of rights so people better understand the, the Chinese perspective on this complex issue? For Chinese, uh, all the rights are mixed together, right, linked together. But when we come uh, to, uh, say, individual life, we also believe that uh, you have to have uh, a decent living standards, right? So if you cannot maintain a decent uh, living standard, how can you talk about other rights, 
right? So this is just a, a common sense. Um, I, I think uh, most of Western s、uh, criticisms about China's human rights records are、uh, uh, uh, pushing the wrong bush.、Uh, for example, Hong Kong, Xinjiang,、uh, you know, in those two places, it's not about the human rights, it's about the separatist movements. Okay? So in Hong Kong, if those people, those young people,、uh, go into the streets,、uh, we're just、uh, fighting for democracy, I don't think the central government would intervene. But in the end, it became an independent movement. And some of those more radical students、uh, began to take weapons, right, to have、uh, real riots. That's quite different. From so called human rights. In Xinjiang, that's the same story. It's not about、uh, human rights, it's about the separatist uh, uh, movements.、Okay? And the China's move、uh, could be described as preemptive moves to defend itself from separation.、Right? So, so, the, so the West depiction of China. It's quite distorted, I have to say that. Just, just a you know, kind of connection to, to this the conversation.、Um, we've also seen in, in the last while、um, increasing kind of, you know, kind of forming, increasing Western allies and allies of the United States,、uh, particularly Australia,、um, becoming a, a lot more kind of critical of China and then China becoming, you know, retaliating against Australia for, you know, in, 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 as in a kind of a back and forth.、Um, is China at the moment feeling itself? Under siege a little bit, or is it feeling that, that, that there is a kind of a coalition de,、um, developing to try and contain China's influence in the world?、Uh, I, I don't think so. I mean, not all the countries、uh, have joined the United States uh, to, uh, I don't know which word I should to bash China. Let's, let's put it in this way. I mean, in the case of Australia, I really don't understand what. Australia has done. I mean, it started from、uh, pointing fingers to China that China sent spies to, you know,、uh, to, uh, uh, to Australia. And uh, uh, you know, I, I actually know the writer of that uh, uh, China report, right?、Uh, so, in that re- it all ignited by that report. And the p- report said, oh, China uh, has uh, penetrated uh, into uh, Australia. And the report actually point,、uh, named several、uh, Chinese Australians as spies. Those Chinese、uh, have got、uh, Australian passports. They were businessmen.、Uh, they were、uh, you know, trying to do business、uh, between those two countries and bring those two countries together. And they were called the spies, the Chinese spies, the baselines.、Okay? And then you know, Australia began to point fingers to China on other things. I, uh, so, I, I just don't understand why Australia was doing that.、Okay? Uh, so, China and Australia have a big uh, trade flows.、Uh, so, China used uh, uh, trade as、uh, a weapon to punish Australia.、Okay? So, that's the, that's the whole st-、uh, story uh, over there.、Okay? Uh, but for China, Australia is not a big uh, uh, player. Right. For, for China, it's just the United States and the Europe.、Okay? Uh, so I, I don't think uh, uh, Australia will make a huge impact on China's foreign policy. But you use the word punish, which I think is very interesting. And in, in, I wrote an article that said about why African countries are reluctant to upset China in some ways because they see what's happening in Australia right now. Is there a concern that? Because China is so aggressively going after Australia to punish it, cutting off buys of dairy, timber, wine, you name it, a long list, and, and to punish, as you pointed out, that it sends a message to other developing countries in the global south that if you cross China or upset China, then you could suffer the same fate as Australia. Now, the exception to that is that Brazil has been very aggressive and outspoken and critical of China, but yet at the same time, there's been no. Blowback against Brazil. So it is confusing, but it is a risk that I think developing countries might take into account as they 
decide whether or not to to take positions that may contrast with China's? Uh, well, Brazil is quite different, right? Brazil is just uh, the the president. I have to call that guy a jerk. Okay, <laughs> he is a jerk. Okay, yeah, but but the, the whole Brazilian government is not uh, uh, going with that guy, right? So the the, Aust- the Brazilian government is much more rational than Australian government. Okay, uh, but. Let me come back to other developing countries. I don't think other developing countries should worry about this, right? Just Australia is acting irrationally, without any purpose, okay? Like catching spies. It's actually Australia domestic issues, okay? It's, it, there's no purpose over there. Okay? Uh, to some extent, they, they should take a lesson from this. You have to be rational. Okay? Uh, I, I, other developing countries, you know, they, uh, they don't have uh, this, uh, this kind of irrational behavior. I don't think China will do anything to them. So, you know, I, I, think, I think it's clear for everyone that... that you know that that China is obviously on the rise as a, as a global power. That um, and that it's to, to fully accommodate. You know the the China's emerging power and emerging global influence. There'll have to be some kind of, you know, kind of readjustments of the global system. Like in in your view, like what what are some of the big things in the way in the way that the world economy or the world kind of governance systems run at the moment that would have to change in order to accommodate a, a fully blooming. China kind of coming into it, the, 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 you know, kind of the, the full flower of, of, its, of its power? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, um, two, almost two years ago, uh, three of us, uh, Danny Roderick from Kennedy School, uh, then Jeff Lehman from N- uh, New York University of Shanghai, and I uh, started uh, a working group. And then in the end, we issued a statement about uh, how to, uh, about the method to tap out uh, and a uh, framework to reform the current uh, world trade system. And in that statement, uh, we believe that we should allow countries to have uh, differential uh, treatments. The current uniform system is not going to work. Uh, just to take the example of United States and China, right? United States needs room for adjustment. Uh, everyone in the U.S., every politician says, oh, we have to bring manufacturing back to the United States. Uh, how to do that? Uh, probably the United States needs room to exercise some trade policies in order to uh, uh, induce American companies to go back to the United States. And on the China side, China is still a different country, uh, we need uh, industrial policies uh, to direct our resources to the fields that we need most, right? But the current WTO rules do not allow that. And we believe that's not going to work uh, in the future. Okay. Uh, so uh, this is also uh, my suggestion. That is, uh, the new world trade system should have uh, differential treatments uh, for different countries. These are very, very difficult subjects to address. And Professor Yao, we are so grateful that you took the time to speak with us and to really just put everything out there. And these are the kind of conversations that we don't have enough And we're so glad that you were able to have it with us, and we really appreciate it. Professor Yao Yang is Dean of the National School of Development at Peking University. He's also the Executive Dean of the Institute of South-South Cooperation and Development and Director of the China Center for Economic Research. Once again, Professor Yao, thank you so much for your time today and for sharing your insights. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Orlando, and thank you, Mr. Weinstein. Kobus, it is so refreshing to be able to have a conversation with someone like Professor Yao where you can just ask him anything. The point of our conversation today was not to challenge or fact check on each and every one of his answers because these are contentious issues and one of those questions alone could have been an entire podcast. So I know that throughout our conversation today, there are going to be points that Professor Yao brought up that a lot of our listeners are going to take objection to, are going to disagree with. That's not the point here. The point here is to be able to hear a clear articulation 
in a non-propaganda way. And then what I mean by a non-propaganda way is we're not hearing it from Global Times or from China Daily or from CGTN or from the trolls on Twitter. We're hearing it from a really accomplished, thoughtful scholar who I have a lot of respect for Professor Yao because I've read his writing. I like the fact that he does a lot of engagement in the Global South. He's speaking to a lot of people. He's very open-minded. And he is willing to come on shows like this and answer all questions with no preconditions. That is a rare thing in the Chinese world, and I wish it wasn't because I think the knowledge deficits that we confront today between China and the outside world are in part because there are not enough of these conversations. And as we heard from Professor Yao, the Chinese worldview is so different than what we know. And I've been doing this now for 35 years, and I feel like when I talk to Professor Yao, I'm starting at zero. I just, and that's the the thrill of studying Chinese affairs, is that it's the puzzle that can never be put back together again. But at the same time, it's such a complicating place to be. Yeah, very much. Um, I think one of the things that's really useful about it is, is you know, be, you know that it it makes clear. I think that that. So the, like, all, all of the other accounts of, of, of China's rise in the world and China's presence in the world are also really kind of ideologically freighted, you know, kind of there, there's, there's no neutral way of looking at China in the world. Um, and I think, you know, I, I, you know we, we, we've spent a lot of time, I think, on, on, on the kind of outlining kind of Western objections, I think, to, to some to aspects of China's rise. Um, you know, Professor Yao has been amazing at, at outlining a Chinese perspective. I think what is what is increasingly, increasingly kind of lacking to my perspective is a southern, a southern kind of view of, of you know, of, of how some of these dynamics particularly like dynamics like in, engaging both the West and China how they are impacting on the global south um, and I, th- I you know I I I'm sometimes kind of like worried that 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 kind of global south stakeholders don't put enough work into articulating their own position um, you know and that yeah particularly governments they don't no 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 there's not a worry about that Cobus they don't and we hear it over and over again. We had Santiago Bustelo on from the Argentinian government. We've heard it over and over again in the Caribbean. Rashid Griffith, who talked to us from the China-Caribbean podcast, we've heard it in Africa. And I, to be honest with you, I'm losing patience with it. I'm absolutely losing patience with it. And, And this was something that came up in our discussion with Bradley Parks over aid data and the research that they did on Chinese loan contracts, that people aren't taking the time and investing the resources to learn about who the Chinese are, how they play the game, what their agendas are, what their history, all the cultural context. It's hard, really hard. But we're now 25 years into this process in China and the global south. Now, there was an excuse 20 years ago that China was new, we don't get them, they're, they're the new player on the, on the block, blah, blah, blah. But that's not an excuse anymore. And so I'm getting a little bit impatient in hearing all of these countries saying, well, we don't understand what's going on when there is so much information out there about the Chinese. And you don't even have to go to China anymore. You can get people to study Chinese online. There's services like Bill Bishop's newsletter. There's our newsletter. There's great, great material out there to learn about China and to get your teams up to speed. So the fact that they are not doing it and closing that knowledge deficit, to me, it's on them. And they need to be held accountable for that. Yeah, I mean, the you know, the, and and the issue isn't only just the knowledge deficit on China; it's a knowledge knowledge deficit around the issues that they engage with China. You know, so so I, I you know I've been kind of tiresomely kind of like quoting coal power electricity statistics the whole, the whole episode um <laughs> you're really deep into this today was, aren't you yeah I'm, I'm busy with the research project on it i can't like it's this endless nightmare and um and so the um but but you know because so i read this amazing article um which i also actually also name checked in, in the newsletter intro for today is the, you know kind of just outlining the kind of the kind of investment that china put into coal-powered uh, electricity in in south and southeast asia over the last 20 years and it's it's, it's 
nuts. It's nuts. Like the, the is like like seven billion dollars into Vietnam, m- like nine billion dollars into Indonesia, like you know, m- mountains of money. And this isn't because China was aggressively like leaning on these countries to implement coal. It's because these countries actively sought out coal. You know, so it's then it's then you know, and and, and keep in mind that Indonesia and India already have like some of the world's worst air quality. You know, so like on top of that they're adding like you know kind of billions of dollars of extra coal added there so it's like when do these global south governments get held accountable for these decisions like you know kind of when are we in a play in a place where we can talk about south africa's liability as a kind of a as a climate criminal because of the amount of coal that they burn and the amount of coal that they export or nigeria's yeah for the amount of oil that they export like you know when when are we having that conversation but the issue here is some of those deeply held embedded narratives that Africa is the victim, the U.S. and Europe are the protagonists, and China is the antagonist. That is kind of how some of these narratives kind of shape out. And I think what you're saying is it's not that clear. I'm not suggesting that China isn't necessarily doing malign things, because I think like any major power, they're pursuing their interests, sometimes at the extent and the expense of other people's interests. That's the nature of being a major power. You get to set the rules for you. You don't have to make compromises. And as a result, if you want coal, great. We've got a lot of coal companies that can help you and we'll finance that, no problem. If you want polluting hydroelectric dams that destroy the environment, sure, we'll do that too. We have no morality in that. That's the Chinese approach on these things. But to your point, it's up to the host government to ask for what they want. And as in the case of Sierra Leone, it's up to the host government to better communicate what they're doing with the Chinese. You, you know, okay, so the Chinese are going to do their secrecy thing and their lack of transparency and the opacity thing. We know that, okay? But for the, the Sierra Leonean government, for example, to start playing these shenanigans, and one African government after another does this. They play right into the opacity thing. And if we're going to be holding governments to account, we also need to be holding those governments to account for the lack of transparency. This is not uniquely a... Chinese thing. This is also a host government thing as well. Yeah, and this is this is why it's so important to have an actual honest conversation about about recipient government agency and African agency in relation to China, because this is the flip side of that issue. It's not only you know so frequently in this kind of agency debate we simply see African governments that that are perceived to have gone against Chinese interests, or have to, I've kind of perceived or have pushed back against Chinese power, are being praised for exercising their agency. But you know this, they're kind of deciding to buy a, a cheap Chinese coal power plan simply because you happen to like coal is just as much a kind of exercise of that local agency you know kind of so so then you you know that that conversation has to be a lot more hard-nosed i think so closing this knowledge deficit one of the topics we talked about at the end of the show and i think that kind of came throughout the whole discussion is it is hard it is really really hard to understand what the chinese are doing they don't make it easy it's difficult to begin with because it's multifaceted there's so many stakeholders it's very opaque They have a lot of contradictions at play. On the one hand, as Kobus pointed out, they're funding clean energy. On the other hand, they're funding coal power plants in Zimbabwe. How does this line up? There doesn't seem to be any coherent strategy. And Professor Yao even alluded to that, that these private companies and even the state-owned enterprises are pursuing their own agendas. And many years ago, Kobus, you and I spoke with Johanna Malm, who's the well-known China Congo expert, And she talked about how the perceptions of how Chinese state-owned enterprises operate in the Congolese mining sector is all wrong. She talked about how they are all competing against each other almost as private actors, not at all being controlled by forces in Beijing or geopolitical forces or at all. So the misperceptions and the misunderstandings are pervasive. And it's something that I think if countries want to advance their ability to engage the Chinese, they're going to have to overcome. And that comes with upping their game and knowing who the Chinese are, how they play the game and what they do. So to that end, I I just I cannot speak enough that you got to get your teams to be more China knowledgeable. I did a lecture and I'd like to get your take on this. I did a lecture at the University of Chicago a couple of weeks ago. And I I advise the students on two trends that are going to shape the rest of their lives and their careers. Number one is going to be China. Now, that's a safe one because for for graduate students for the next 50 years, China is going to reshape the international order, whether for good or for bad, but it is going to be a presence in their lives. 
The other one I said is that Trumpism is also going to reshape the international order. And Trumpism is also a phenomena like China that is very poorly understood and will have an enormous impact on the world. And so those are the two big trends that I think we have massive knowledge deficits in that we have to close. We have to better understand the forces behind Trumpism and China. Uh, yeah, I, I I think that's a really smart take. The um, the Because the thing is, uh, you know, Trumpism, I think, our, you know, started before Trump himself came on the scene in the US. You know, there was a lot about the Zuma era in, in South Africa that made that, uh, that Trumpism didn't particularly kind of um, surprise me, or particularly the tactics of Trumpism. Um, for example, the 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 kind of overcoming built-in checks and balances within the US system by staffing, massively kind of staffing these institutions with Trump appointees. Like all of that, that game, that game book came out of the Zuma <laughs> kind of playbook, you know, um, on in, in South Africa. And and those kinds of kind of like like popular strong men, um, you know, kind of riding social media into into kind of a using a kind of social media culture wars in order to 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 build up power, that isn't unique to the US. You know that that is a that is a, a dynamic we're seeing in many countries, um, and you know it's 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 a convenient name you know to call it Trumpism, but but I think in a lot of ways Trump is is one iteration of of this kind of wider problem. But that may be the case, but there are unique characteristics to the phenomena in the United States, and given the disproportionate power and influence of the United States, while autocracy and big man politics is not a new thing, especially in Africa. It is new to the United States, and the world is not familiar yet with what that looks like in a U.S. context. Yes, or or, or in a kind of a you know with with, with in larger terms in, with with all of the kind of weapons and riches of a, of a rich kind of Western democracy kind of behind. That's it. right. Yeah, and this naive notion that because Joe Biden is president of the United States, that somehow Trumpism is now gone. I hear that over and over again from my liberal friends, and I just want to scream because it just is a level of cluelessness that to me is shocking. Yeah. And, you know, kind of, and, and, and we're still seeing, you know, kind of similar kind of dynamics in the UK, you know, it's, it's not gone. And, um, so, so, you know, I, what I guess the issue is, is, is how it's, how those two things are going to interact, you know, kind of how, how this, this tendency in, in, in Western countries with the, the kind of, you know, like the kind of outlines that we're seeing of, of, of how China thinks of its own power in the world, how those two are going to interact over the next 10 years. Well, we cannot help you better understand Trumpism because I am sure there are 55 other sources out there that can do that far better than we can. We can help you understand what China is doing in the global south and in the geopolitical arena. And we do that every day in our newsletter and our website. And we would hope that you would want to better understand and close your own knowledge deficit. And you can do that by subscribing to the China Africa Project. Subscriptions start at just $7 a month for students and teachers, $15 a month for everybody else. With that subscription, you get full access to all the content that we are producing with our contributors from around Africa and around the world, many inside of China as well. Also, you will get a daily email newsletter that is sent to you with all of the insights and analysis that Cobus and I put together. I do most of the writing. Cobus does columns throughout the week as well. And again, we're trying to help you better understand and connect these dots on what China's doing. This is not something that you can just read one or two books and kind of get up to speed. In fact, that is actually in many ways counterproductive simply because events in Africa and the global south are happening so fast and they're changing day by day that if you're not looking at the micro movements of this relationship, you're missing the macro trends. That is the only way to pick up the macro trends is by looking at the day by day. We hope that you'll come and join us on this journey. Once again, chinaafricaproject.com slash subscribe. Enter the promo code podcast and we'll give you 20% off. So we would uh, really appreciate that. And we hope that you find it useful as well. If you have any questions, you can email me directly, eric at chinaafricaproject.com or cobus, C-O-B-U-S at chinaafricaproject.com. So that'll do it for this edition of the podcast. Cobus and I will be back again next week with another episode. Until then, for Cobus van Staden, I'm Eric Olander. Thank you so much for listening. continues online. Head over to facebook.com slash China Africa Project to share your thoughts on today's show. Or follow the guys on Twitter, Eric's at Iolanda, and you can find Kobas at Stadenesk. 
For more information about the China Africa Project and to sign up for our free weekly email news brief, go to chinaafricaproject.com. <laughs>